good afternoon everyone i think uh, uh, and welcome to fifth episode of scm talk show i think we had four earlier and today is the fifth one and uh, as you know that we will have it every fortnight so we had one on the 26th september another one today is 10 so we will have on 24th after that i think we may have to do after uh, three weeks because of diwali so we will do that and the topics that we have uh, for each scm talk show is based on the survey that we had uh, sent it to all of you and your responses so based on your responses you know we have selected the topic and a lot of topics have uh, you know been requested so i think we are trying to go one by one and uh, trying to uh, you know select the topic which have been most asked for first and that is how we are going so as uh, I think Mr. Shah just said that the session is recorded, and it will be made available to you free of cost on the, our mobile app also, and our YouTube channel also. Uh, so we are going to put everyone on listen-only mode. If you have any questions during or at the end of the, uh, you know, talk, you know, please type in the chat box, and uh, I will appreciate that if you can keep typing the questions as and when it comes to your mind, so that you know. Nistush can collect all those questions and you know he can probably ask the question towards the end. So we will see how much time is left out towards the end and then probably you know we will uh, take those questions. So to begin with, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Asim Bhera. So Asim, uh, we met earlier, we worked earlier. So Asim is presently the CEO and board member of Ifuku India. Uh, he also sits on the board of Vega Conveyors and Automation Private Limited. So we thought that he is the best speaker on this topic, right? Okay. So he joined Daifuku India in 2013 to set up Inter Logistics Automation Division of, for Daifuku Japan in India. Today, Daifuku India is dominant player in Inter Logistics Automation field in India. So I think I hear, I understand these terms, and I will explain it more. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Oklahoma State University. Uh, post this, he worked with Swiss Log, another interlogistics automation company in the US, and was a key member in the interlogistics automation journey for mega retailers such as Walmart and Target. And I'm sure that in you know, all of us, we see a lot of videos nowadays, I think especially more on WhatsApp, we flood with videos where we see a lot of warehouse automation, uh, a claim to be for the warehouse of Walmarts and Targets and Amazons and I don't know all of that kind of things. So I think we really get excited. So he moved to India from the US in 2011. And since then he has been pursuing his passion for bringing in the world's best practices to supply chain warehousing sector in India. So Asim loves the challenge to explain local business owners on what an ideal factory should be by leveraging automation and that is why I think he is here. So he lives in Mumbai uh, like me and uh, uh, with his wife and two kids. So welcome Asim. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity for having me. I'm excited to be here. And you, you, you're most welcome. So let's actually begin our uh, talk show. Um, so I think we, uh, as I said earlier, we see a lot of uh, videos and a lot of, uh, uh, I think on the WhatsApp, you know, of a lot of warehouse automation and a lot of talk about um, automated warehouses where there's no man is there. And they, during this pandemic, I think a lot of people have been talking about uh, touchless deliveries and touchless picking and, you know, where you have uh, total automation. So no human being is required and there is no possibility of, uh, you know, uh, transmitting the virus. So all that we've been talking about. Uh, so I think some of us know what these automations are. Some of us, we don't know. And if you go and search on the web, I think there is a huge amount of automation options which are available, uh, which we don't know, uh, you know, what is available in reality and what is really, uh, uh, you know, a fantasy. We don't really know that. So I would like you to clear some of these doubts. What sort of automation uh, are available, and what is going to be available in reality? 
in actual reality in the near future. I mean, not really so much a distance. We are not talking about 20 years, 30 years down the line. But in the near future, what sort of automation is going to be available in the warehouses? Okay, to you. Uh, thank you. That's a fantastic question, and it's a very broad question. So uh, yeah. I think I'll have to cover different different bits of it, and I will try to do that. So um, at first, I think let's start with uh, mechanization. You know, so at first you have your manual warehouses where everything is done by people. And then uh, eventually you figure out that if something is uh, repetitive and it's redundant, no point having people do back and forth. Let's mechanize it. Mechanize because it's a continuous flow of things. And that is something that, you know, uh, if you can repurpose the humans, you can use that in a better way. So mechanization is, let's say, the first step uh, when you invest in some sort of uh, um, automation, quote unquote. So mechanization would be, let's say, conveyors. Uh, typically, it's mostly case conveyors. Uh, the idea is to move uh, something from point A to point B without the human doing it. Right. So um, that uh, then leads to what are the next steps? So if you look at a warehouse, right? So you've got basically inbounding. Uh, then you have where you do a basically a goods receipt. Then there you kind of sort it in a certain fashion that will help the your warehouse setup. Once you do that, you then basically uh, or something. Like that. So can you hear me? Yeah, I think you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. No problem. But I think okay, can you hear me fine? Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Okay. All right, sorry, so I'll continue. So so in the warehouse, as I was saying, you've got different processes, mainly the inbound. Once the inbound happens, then you've got a, a GRN where you basically acknowledge what you have received, you uh, check it, and then you sort it in some way or fashion that is going to be useful for your later processes. And then you store it. After you store it, you then have to pick it, order, consolidate, and dispatch. So each of these facets, you can you know do it manually. That's how it's been done for... Uh, many decades now, or you can find ways to do it either by mechanization or automation. And the whole purpose of what's driven automation, let's say, you know, uh, outside of India, is either because it's been uh, um, uh, availability of uh, people who are going to do the work, or it's uh, the 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 throughput is so high that the humans can't keep up, um, or it is the is the environment. So, for example, you know, where you have freezer environment, minus 30, minus 40 for your ice creams and frozen um, goods. You don't have people going in there, and eating, right? Uh, so, it's a combination of these factors that have kind of, uh, 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 been a catalyst to have done automation. Why people are embracing automation. So, if I broadly divide, let's say, in geographies, yeah? So, you've got, let's say, the US, Europe, and Japan, for example, right? So in US, there's a whole lot of mechanization that's happened because simply because it's a huge country, everything is pretty huge. The warehouses are, you know, upward of five lakh square feet. And then in such a huge warehouse, you know, you need conveyors to move it from point A to point B, no point human doing it. Or you need AGVs to move palletized load, what have you. Um, in Europe, uh, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of automation happens a lot of high level of automation happens because they have very strict labor laws in terms of how much can a person do manual work in a given time frame. But you know, if you're running a warehouse, you have to supply to your customers, work has to go on. But if you have labor laws which define the parameters of what you can exert on the human, then you have to find ways to aid the human so that you can increase its efficiency. So that's why a lot of automation happens there. Um, in, in Japan, for example, in Japan, basically, it's an aging population. So warehouse work is hard, laborious work, you know, backbreaking work. So there you have all sorts of uh, uh, technology and aid to help do the physical work easier. Right. And if I talk in the Indian context now, um, we are at basically in, uh, in, a, in a very interesting time as with everything in India, you know. Uh, you know, we, we just kind of leapfrog into stuff. And I think if you uh, look at automation, um, you know, the interlogistic automation, 
mostly how what we have seen progress in different countries is at first you have warehouses connected to a factory and you see some sort of automation going in there simply because it's a continuous process in a factory you know what you're producing you know how much you're producing you know day in and day out what your SKUs are going to be right so because of the predictability you kind of do automation because everything till that time you've automated you've automated your manufacturing you've automated your packing lines and then okay the last bit before loading the truck why don't i automate so we've seen that being as the start of why automation takes place and then you automation you start seeing in retail modern retail modern retail do a lot of automation simply because they have to carry thousands of sku they have to the throughputs are very high and therefore to service the stores with thousands of SKU in harsh environments like a freezer application or a, uh, or a, or a zero degree application, you see a whole lot of automation going in there, right? And then what's happening of late, the last, let's say maybe 2014 onward in India, at least is this e-commerce, right? And um, you know, I always like to say, E-commerce has now become to interlogistics automation what automotive industry is to the other sorts of automation. It is asking and driving and it's saying, I need this, I need this, I need this. So um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I, I can't hear you. OK, so basically what happens is um, so e-commerce is this it is just consuming and demanding automation. And in India, what has happened is so the factory automation, I think the journey started as early as the 2000s. You know, you had a few companies, mostly the pharma pharma sector, adopting a lot of automation. And uh, they would do this automation because most of their material was, the finished good was for export. And so every time a contract manufacturer had to manufacture for company A. So he would make a whole lot, if let's say, you know, 1000 pallets worth of material, and then he has to, clean his machines, switch over for company B. So now what does he do with this thousand pallets? You know, these are pharmaceutical products. They have to be stored hygienically. They have to be stored in a proper way. You have to have traceability. So therefore, a lot of ASRS applications went in, automatic and stored retrieval system only for the finished good. And this was just to hold bulk and to hold it in a proper, a proper way, in a safe way. And then when they manufacture somebody else's, then they would again store that. So you would see systems where you had maybe at most 4,000, 5,000 pallet storage systems, but with ASRS so that they could produce in one lot for an end customer and store it, right? So this started happening in the 2000s. And then I think uh, 2011, 12 onward, there was more of this connecting the factory to the storage um, and uh, that kind of took off. And that was still, it is still in its, uh, uh, let's say it's still growing up. And then 2015, e-commerce happened. So somehow we skipped modern trade. We skipped the need for automation in modern trade because the majority of the you know retail in India is still the uh, Kirana stores. And then from there we leapfrog to e-commerce, right? <laughs> and then and then in e-commerce now you've got uh, in India you've got uh, the two of the biggest American players, you know, really fighting it out to gain market share and to gain customers, to gain, to give them the whole feeling of e-commerce. And in e-commerce, you know, you have upward of a million SKUs. You have upward of a million SKUs. And uh, in this, uh, uh, you know, it is impossible for a person to go and search something in, uh, you know, one of the million things, find it, check it, pack it, and dispatch it in time to give you the service level that you expect. Because, you know, when you click on it, you know, you want it maybe today, but you know, then you have to pay more for it. If it's free shipping, maybe it says, okay, free shipping, but you will get it by this date. So we have all these things that play up and because of which, uh, how to make it easy for the person to pick is kind of the automation that's been driving, uh, being driven in the e-commerce. So this is kind of the flavor of, you know, what has happened globally and what's happening in India. And also globally at this point, e-commerce is the biggest driver for companies like us, and I, I think I would not be, I would not be too wrong to say, globally maybe as close as 30 to 40 percent of business is coming from e-commerce companies, which is significant. Which is significant. Yeah. 
Right. So actually, uh, what kind of equipment you know we are talking about? Uh, you know, uh, what kind of automation we are talking about? Okay. So um, as I mentioned, that you know you have these four or five processes in a warehouse, uh, and it depends on which one do you want to automate. So I think maybe your question is India specific. So I will stick to India specific. Right. So in India specific, um, obviously, uh, uh, you know something as automatic. Let's say, let's let's assume I'm uh, you know I'm taking this this uh, case coming in from a truck. Now, you know you have all these technologies for automatic truck unloading, right? But that is not necessary in India because most of our stuff comes in as loose packets. We don't have palletized transportation within the trucks. So palletized palletization happens within the warehouse. So therefore, automatic unloading of truck is not something that I see as immediate need. However, to increase the efficiency of people. What's happening now is so when you're unloading a truck, you can have as much as eight to ten people working in a very cramped up area in a dog door, going inside a truck and moving stuff out, and that leads to chaos. It leads to some sort of maybe a safety challenge. So what we've seen pick up, uh, you know, in the last uh, maybe four or five years is telescopic conveyors. So we're seeing the demand for telescopic conveyors going up. A telescopic conveyor is nothing but a piece of conveyor which then extends into the truck bed. And then you only have two people unloading um, from the truck. You've got nothing in between, and then maybe two people at the other end unloading from the conveyors, and then probably putting it on a pallet or putting it on a cage trolley. So this is one sort of a um, mechanization that has that we see an uptick uh, in the last five years. Um, so now, once you've received everything, then the question comes: as you are putting it on a pallet or on a cage, normally you could also automate that. But that level of automation is expensive, and also the, um, the the case that comes in because of the way it's being loaded on the truck, because of the transportation, may not be in the perfect shape to have a robot or something pick it up, right? Because what automation needs is something well defined. If it is well defined, automation works very well. If it is not well defined, you know the case may be compressed here or squashed here. Chances of failure is high. So, you know, from picking up from a telescopic conveyor to loading it on a pallet can be automated, but that is not something that gives you the most ROI in India, simply because the cases are going to be different and it's not, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, you can control the speed of it, so you don't need to do that. Once you do, let's say, make a pallet, then of course, uh, you know, you have to attach a barcode or something to it because you have to identify what this pallet has. What sort of SKUs, ha SKUs it has when it came in, all of that. So that happens via, uh, you know, a WMS ERP and a handheld and a scanner. All of that happens. So that scanner barcode is going up. Business, I think, for the companies who are in that is going up quite a bit. Um, and then once you've done that, then the question is, uh, how do I store it? Am I storing it in palletized form? Am I storing it in case form? How far is it from where I? and making this pallet to where I have to store. So that again can be conveyorized. You can put a piece of conveyor so it can take it from point A all the way to a certain point out in the warehouse to point B, or you can have uh, automated guided vehicles who do that, AGVs. Uh, each of them have their own pros and cons, and that will be a detailed explanation. Or you could have, uh, if you're, you're dealing with cases, you can have case conveyors and then what we're seeing is now a lot of this e-commerce, you know, they're building warehouses as mezzanine over mezzanine over mezzanine, because for them they don't store things in pallets. For them, it's always cases or pieces, because they don't store, you know, they don't need to have 20 of something. They need to have one of 20 things, because that's what you know they, they offer. So therefore, they need to have a very spread out space. So therefore. Uh, because it's mezzanines over mezzanines, and that's the most efficient way. So you see a lot of spiral conveyors, you know, that takes material from the ground floor to the different levels. And then once it gets there, you have somebody picking it up, putting in a trolley and taking it to a rack location, right? Um, so these are some of the things that happens in the inbound. And then outbound would be the opposite of that. Would be the opposite of But the biggest, I think, when people look at uh, what sort of automation people are investing in more so I think it would be for picking and sorting and picking and sorting is something that is happening a lot in e-commerce because they have to pick stuff fast 
Once they pick it, it has to go to a destination, which is sorting. And after they have sorted it, it has to go to a pin code, which again needs sorting. So I think picking and sorting is kind of the need of the hour in terms of automation, especially in e-commerce, what uh, the industry is demanding. And how about ASRS? You know, I uh, I worked on an uh, I think mini loader uh, somewhere back in '85 in the U.S. You know, trying to integrate that with an ERP. Okay, that time the ERP name was not there, but you know, uh, that was controlled by PDP11, DEC PDP11, and tried to integrate that. And I saw one of the video from Daifuku of this Everest Masala. Right. So, what is the popularity of ASRS, and how cost-effective are these automations? Sure. Thank you. So Daifuku, well, Daifuku globally does a whole bunch of stuff. I think we can pretty much do anything. You can even have, we can do a warehouse where you need no people. But I think in India, primarily we are focusing, we have been focusing on the ASRS. Um, that is just to stay focused because there's so many things to do out there. So the last uh, six, seven years, we've been primarily focusing on ASRS. In the ASRS, you've got two different classifications, if you will. One is pallet handling, which is called unit load, and the other one is a mini load, which is case handling, right? And in between the two, there's multiple bifurcations, you know, there's this, that, and the other, but I won't get to it. So uh, for us uh, at Daifuku India, we've actually delivered both systems. We've had the privilege and the opportunity to find customers who see this as a need. So we've done uh, uh, unit load, pallet loads, as well as mini loads. Uh, of course, the unit load is much more the quantity than the mini load, uh, simply because in a unit load, it's a whole pallet, a one ton pallet I'm handling, versus in a case I'm handling one case of 30 kilos. So I have to do that many more. I need to be faster. I need to have a need for that. Um, so ASRS is an interesting thing. So ASRS, again, uh, is uh, not just a storage system. It can be used in plethora of ways, it's depending on how you design it, the application, and how you fit into a customer's business need that determines the most efficient use of ASRS. Um, so uh, uh, traditionally, you know, one thing that ASRS people always think is just a big storage box. Uh, yes, it is. It's a very high dense storage box, uh, you know, a Jenga, if you will. Uh, but it's not just that. Depending on how you design the ins, outs and all of it, you can also use it for uh, sorting. You can also use it for picking. You can use it for multiple applications. And that is something that actually Daifuku India has kind of pushed to its customer that don't look at ASRS just as a storage device. If you plan it right, you can use it for sorting and picking. And that's been a little bit of you know the success that we've got versus uh, the others in the market. So uh, ASRS, um, the problem is you asked you know uh, the, the, the economical. So uh, it depends on your current situation. So for example, um, if you ask, is there a direct return of investment when you do something like an ASRS? Normally in the West, you could say, yeah, three years, three years you could do that. Why? Because the fact that you've put in an ASRS, so uh, de facto you have, uh, you, you, you have the opportunity to repurpose some of the people that you have that you are doing manually to something else. So when you take that value out and put them somewhere else in a higher value uh, uh, in a higher value output. So the amount of people that you moved away is what your ROI is. So for example, if an ASR system costs, let's say $2 million, but you know, you have repurposed 30 people from here to somewhere else. So 30 times $50,000 each. Yeah, three years you get the ROI, but that's not the case in India. That's not the case in India. You can so, what is, so what is the investment range we are talking about? So it all depends, but I think the minimum for an ASRS could be, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, for us, it's something like 10 crores. And it can go upward to 100 crores. 100 crores. Okay. About 10 crores is like, let's say, the base. But that 10 crores, if I just do the people count, I'll never get an ROI. But right. yet, the people are doing it. And people are doing it for various seasons. So we have a customer who basically has a factory close to Bombay. He is doing very well. He needs to expand and he needs to have more production flow. As you produce more, you have to store more. But yeah, you don't have that much land. Land is expensive in and around Mumbai. So guess what? He did go in for an ASRS because to him that was the ROI. That he went 
buying land, moving my storage somewhere else is going to be much more expensive than if I can store everything here vertically. So he's got about a, a 18 meter high mini load storage system and it's worked out very well for him because the alternate would have been expensive, right? So apart from e-commerce, which kind of industries usually go for automation, warehouse automation? Uh, so I think the if I talk about just mechanization, which is conveyors, I think that is happening all across. Okay. So one of the biggest consumers of conveyors is your manufacturers. You know, they need to move stuff in a continuous way from point A to point B. So that is already happening. And the increase in the conveyors is quite a bit. I think in the last decade you've seen the need for conveyors has gone up quite a bit. Of course, different type of conveyors. And I'm not talking about bulk conveyors, I'm talking about uh, unit conveyors. Uh, conveyors have gone up significantly. And if you look around the market, you can see many conveyor players. You can see many companies who have repurposed themselves to now supply conveyors. Um, ASRS, if you talk about ASRS, I think, uh, you know, when I started out in 2011, and I used to go explain somebody what an ASRS was, many a times, you know, unfortunately, because I could not show them something, Right. They would think it maybe it's a tall forklift. Right. They really think it's a tall forklift, right? And, and and then from then to now, where we actually have active inquiries, people are calling us from all segments, from all food and beverage, pharmaceutical, electrical, any you name it, paint. They're calling us and they want to know how much it's going to cost. So I think in this whole decade, there has been a paradigm shift from imagining it as a tall forklift or not being able to imagine it to now asking how much is it right so i think there's been a paradigm shift in the asrs world um and then i think as i said earlier in the e-commerce it's all about picking and sorting right so i think there are a lot of components to this automation i, I in terms of software i'm not talking about this in terms of hardware i think some something that controls these automation and uh, somewhere you have this erp or wms sitting in between and so on so what are the roles of each ones and you know um, uh, what uh, I mean which component does what and you know which component does not do? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So of course, like you said, there is the hardware. So we won't talk about the hardware, we've spoken about the hardware now. But to control the hand and legs, you need the brain, you need the central nervous system, you need all of that, right? So uh, most of everything you know, is on a PLC network, a programmable logic control, right? There are different companies who give PLCs. You've got Siemens, Rockwell, Mitsubishi, all these companies give different PLC application. So these are the things that start, stop, uh, electrical device, start, stop a motor. Um, and all of these are then controlled in a grid, which is a PLC. And this PLC then has to have a controller, uh, a brain or a traffic management system which is basically the WCS, the warehouse control system. So let's say if I have an ASRS, if I have a conveyor, they both need to talk to each other, right? So the conveyor has its own PLC, the ASRS has its own PLC. For both of them to handshake, right, I need a WCS. If it's a complicated system, if it's a simple system, it could be a direct one-to-one, -one. but if it's more than a certain equipment, I need a WCS. So the WCS then what it does is it basically does the most important thing it does is route management and traffic management. So if something is coming here, which one of the ASRS do I put into? If something is going out, do I have enough space in my conveyor buffer to put it out and still not cause a jam? So all of that is the WCS uh, of it. The minute I start managing inventory, if I am now holding inventory, I know that okay, this pallet A is a pallet of chips, salted chips, and it was manufactured on this date and its freshness date is this and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm holding somebody's inventory, then I need a warehouse management software, WMS, because that's when I'm holding inventory. So so, um, so you have the PLC at the, at the base level, you then you have the um, WCS controlling multiple PLC, then you have the WMS sitting on top because now this guy knows the inventory, he knows where to allocate and this guy then follows to different subsystems. And then on top of this is the ERP. So the ERP mostly ends up being the customer's main um, main uh, product, main thing where it does everything. They do their sales forecasting, they see their inventory, they see what's available in different warehouses across the country or across the state. 
So ERP is at a customer level. It's their whole window to their business. And the WMS then reports into the ERP for that particular site or automation system, if you will. So I think uh, when I spoke to you in the past, you know, there are some challenges that you face when you talk about automation. Uh, one of the thing I remember is how to take the physical inventory uh -huh. uh, into all this. So, so can you talk about some of these challenges which are uh, in the environment are quite different than when it, it was probably manual? Yeah, 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 you are right. So there are a lot of uh, statutory requirement which uh, is uh, which worked maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, and they were written down in that time. And in that time, you did not have an ASRS in India. So because of which, you know, everything was, let's say, out on the floor, and you could, uh, you know, if you are a tax tax uh, officer, and you want to make sure that you are collecting taxes of all the goods manufactured, you would want to see it in open site. You would want to go out and count and maybe have a list you could check off, okay, this, 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 and the other. Uh, but that in an ASRS is impossible because <laughs> ASRS, you know, a basic ASRS is at least 20 meters tall. The aisles are very narrow. It's almost a lights out building. Stuff comes in, manufactured, goes in. I mean, how are you going to, you know, go inside and uh, do, I mean, you can go inside, but it's not, uh, it's not all that open to go and see stuff. So how are you going to do that? So obviously, um, 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 I think certain uh, segments have found a way where uh, they are able to talk to the tax officials and say, OK, this is what we manufactured. This is what we put in the warehouse. Before we put it in the warehouse, we'll give you a count. So either they are sending cases coming in from the factory before it gets palletized. So there's a case count, right? Or if they're sending pallets, when they're making the pallets, they're scanning each one of those boxes and keeping account. So those are sort of technology they're able to convince to the tax authorities that this is what we're going to do. Uh, but then there are other segments, for example, I don't know, let's say uh, tobacco. It's it's a very uh, tax rich, uh, uh, you know, tax rich commodity, and you know you don't want to miss anything there. There, no matter what you tell the tax office, he's not going to accept. He'll say he'll say no. I want to see everything <laughs> on the floor. I don't believe what you have. So. <laughs> In that instance, so I think in the tobacco segment, I don't think we'll have an ASRS anytime soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it depends on the industry, it depends on the segment. So I also want to know what are the challenges in maintenance and reliability because there's a lot of equipment, hardware, electrical, electronics, software, there are a lot of things which are there. So what is the uh, you know challenges in reliability and the maintenance of this equipment? You know, uh, if there's something breaks down, you know. Uh, where the whole system stops and how do you handle one of the concerns I think everyone, all of us would have. Sure, sure. So can yeah. you speak something yeah. on that? That's a fantastic question as well. And I think uh, uh, that becomes a differentiator as well. Um, so so, so uh, um, obviously, you know, a lot of these technologies are, are not rocket science. They're not at the bleeding edge at this moment because they have been developed, deployed globally for decades on. So they are tried and tested. Um, so uh, in terms of being able to, uh, you know, in terms of being able to uh, figure out, you know, what the, what the, what the, uh, what the, uh, you know, reliability and all of that is, I think um, it, it's not, it's not a question anymore. I, I think, uh, you know, over time companies like us have been able to, you know, find out issues and been able to solve it and make it more reliable generation over generation. So, so from a reliability perspective, I think depending on the company you go with, you get that equipment. And then also the question is about how the design is put together. If it's a design that's already been tested and it has been out there, so you already know what the issues are going to be, right? Uh, and then you can plan ahead. Um, and uh, I think electronics in general and the PLCs in general have become very reliable over time. Have become extremely reliable over time because of the sheer improvement in IT and electronics. So from the, the uh, from the point of equipment failure, yes, it can happen. But then you build in redundancies. You know, you look at your single point of failure, and I say, okay, this is going to be a single point of failure, and if this stops, it's going to create so much of an issue. I will probably have a backup server. 
or I'll probably have a backup equipment. But if this fails, it's a automatic switch over and I get an error that, hey, something has happened, please go look at it. So I think in terms of reliability, the equipment per se and the components that make the equipment have come a long way that nobody really doubts it. And then if you go with a company who's been doing it for over a long period of time, you know that you know they probably have all their bugs fixed up. Um, so for example, uh, you know a drone flying and delivering a package that is at the bleeding edge of technology. That for us humans also imagine that something flying overhead and nothing falls. You know that's the big question. But for example, right. something like as an ASRS, you know it's a place where nobody's going to go. You know it's something that's all properly fenced. It's all a controlled environment. So it's going to work on its own. So I think um, if we look at uh, our customer base and the questions for most customers ask. Yes, they do ask about, uh, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? And I think if you're able to give them an explanation and if you're able to show them in the design that you've already built in some redundancies, I think they get convinced. They get convinced. Right. And once they do it, they're a believer. But that first step is the difficult one. Thank you so much. And I think we see a lot of videos, keep seeing a lot of videos about touchless delivery, touchless. I think we see a lot of, uh, videos on Amazon robot picking and robot delivery and all of that. And then uh, I think so how practical is that, uh, you know, some physical counting by drones. So a lot of things in the, oh, during this pandemic, I think people got scared and how to even, you know, the auditors didn't want to go to warehouses. They use drones, I think, to do physical counting. How so how practice oriented this touchless thing is uh, right. and especially in Indian environment. I'm talking. Sure, sure. Well, thank you. And uh, yes, I don't blame anyone to be extra cautious. You know, when you don't know what you're up against, uh, you know, everybody's cautious. So, so, so I don't blame the people who don't really want to go to a warehouse to do an audit. Uh, but still, business has to continue, and audits have to be done, right? And uh, so, a lot of this touchless. The minute you start automating pieces, you know, so automation is something like you know, when I'm handling a pallet, it's cheaper than when I'm handling a case. Now from a case, if I'm handling a, each, if I break pack, if I open a case, it's called a break pack. And then if I'm handling one unit, so the more I handle a smaller unit of measure, the more sophisticated, the more expensive it becomes. That's the general curve that you have, right? So uh, um, uh, in, in the US, in the US, for example, you know, right now because e-commerce is growing at such an amazing pace, that even if they want, they don't have enough people to come in and do the work, right? And also, there's all, always a finite amount of space. You cannot build a, a you know a multi-million dollar square foot. It won't be efficient. It won't be efficient. You always want everything as condensed as possible. So the minute you do that, you cannot throw in that many humans to do stuff. It's just impossible. The physical space and also now with physical distancing, all of that, it's just impossible. So therefore, even before the pandemic, uh, the you know uh, the picking of stuff by robots had happened. A lot of improvement has happened in the last five years actually, and a lot of this has happened because of two things. One is the vision technology, that the cameras have become very sophisticated and their cost also is going down, so that you know the to adopt that as a system to see something is increasing. And then the other is the gripper mechanism. How good am I to grip something? How can I emulate the human? the human arm, the human hand. So this emulation of the human hand is something that's also increasing quite a bit. So I think these two things in the last five years uh, have increased quite a bit and they have led to such technologies where you've got picking by robots. Um, obviously the pandemic has been a catalyst and I think more and more companies are now seeing that, you know, this has happened, we were not prepared for it, but we have to now prepare for the future. And That's in crazy. the future, I have to start. If something, I don't know when it's going to happen again, but I just need to start thinking now how to run my business. So I think uh, um, in countries which already have a high level of automation, this touchless picking is going to be a very real thing in the next five years with the way technology is going. In the Indian context, I think it's still uh, it's still uh, some uh, some years down the road, mostly because. Uh, um, we have to reach to a certain level of automation elsewhere first before we get to this. So right now we see an uptick into the automation before this. So I think that has to happen to a great extent and then we go to this 
touchless and um, uh, man, you know, personless picking and all of that stuff. So it's going to be some time. Thank you so much, Asim. I think you gave real practical insight, you know. So I think one is uh, the fantasy, what I, if I may call it. <laughs> and second is reality and uh, under our Indian condition. Right. So I think uh, thank you for giving a clear picture of what is possible and what is not possible, at least in India from the cost effectiveness point of view. All right. So I'll go to another segment, uh, you know, asking you about your personal uh, career journey. So I would like to know from your school education, how did you end up into this warehouse automation or interlogistics? Right. Um, I, I, I laugh because uh, uh, I don't think anybody plans to be in your <laughs> automation. That's Somehow right. you get into it and you like it enough that you stick around, honestly. Yeah. Um, 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 you know, so I have, um, so, so by qualification, uh, you know, I've got an electrical engineering degree, electrical and computers. Uh, that was no way close to what I do now. Yes, it, it gave me a, a infrastructure, but it's nowhere what I'm doing right now. And I don't think there are many schools out there who do this, right? Um, but I remember uh, I was looking for a job after um, I graduated. And, uh, uh, and then I had given my resume to everybody that, hey, to hear something, please, 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 please hand it out. So I'd given it to everybody I knew, you know. And um, um, all of a sudden, I get a call from uh, one of the guys. Uh, you know, uh, he says, you know, I'm so and so calling from Swisslog, and uh, are you still looking for a job? I said, very much so. He said, okay, why don't you come down and uh, uh, you know, and and then um, we'll see. So that was the first time ever I wa walked into a warehouse, a big retail warehouse. And I just saw, you know, a 25 meter tall structure and pallets moving automatically, stuff doing. And it was like a Disneyland. To be mm -hmm. honest, you know, being an electrical engineer, the only thing move I had seen was the oscilloscope. You know, you stick it into a breadboard or something, you see right. something. And that was as good as it got. Yeah. And here I'm seeing these machines, you know, they're just moving automatically. Nobody's manning them. They're just moving. They're doing their stuff. And I was pretty wowed. You know, it was honestly uh, just a moment where I said, wow, this is so surreal. And um, I, I remember the gentleman asked me, he says, um, so, uh, you know, let me walk you around first. He said, do you know what we do? I said, I looked up on the website, but I could not understand very well. And even now, I don't think my wife knows what I do. You know, <laughs> it's difficult to explain what you do, right? So, yeah. so, so I said, let, let me take you around. And he took me around. I was just wowed. It was a one hour long walkthrough. Uh, and I was just wowed by everything. And the system was just being commissioned. It was not in its full form. So I could get a chance to go close to the equipment. And I was just amazed. And he, he came back to his office. And he says, so what do you want to do? You want to do... Uh, project management, you want to design systems, you want to do software, you want to do, I said, I have no idea. I don't know how this works, but give me something. I like what I see. Please give me something, I'll figure it out. And uh, he says, okay, we need help, uh, you know, finishing the site. So when can you come in? I said, next week. He said, okay, come in. And then that was that. And after that, to be honest, uh, uh, you know, I was one of the first engineers in that company in the US. Uh, because everything was being done from overseas and I got a lot of opportunity to work and the more I worked the more wild I could and I think the biggest thing for me was um, you know that designing something in a piece of paper on the computer and then actually it with me and that was something that lasted a, a lasting impact on me and um, then somewhere in between I think after five six years I said you know I've seen enough of this what more can I do so I switched jobs uh, I switched everything I started working as a uh, you know uh, in at a company which is the largest uh, wastewater treatment and i was going to manage their budget and all of that and i did that uh, i did that it was good but i think after the second year i realized no i really like to you know push a button and see stuff moving by themselves i think that is really what i like so i came back i i, I came back to uh, uh swiss log and uh, i think i've been in this industry then so so uh, it was something that just happened by a phone call to a resume I sent, and mm -hmm. it's just stayed on. And I think of all the people I've also met in this industry, in the US, Europe, I always say this, that you'll always meet the same people, but on, 
it may be on different side of the table. Right. The customer, they might be a partner, they might be a vendor. So same faces, but on different side of the table. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, I, is this the only way to learn on the job, or there are courses and certifications on the warehousing? Uh, do you know something about it, or the only way is to learn on the job? Well, no. You you've got what you do, Apex, right? You've got yeah. that. That is that is that is a fantastic program that is out there. That at least is a structured course, you know. Um, so I think in universities, the closest you get is uh, industrial engineering. Okay. So the closest you get from an industry course, uh, I don't know if things have changed in the last decade, but I was talking when I was there, you know, back in 2000, 2005, there was nothing. The closest you could get was industrial engineering. And because of that, because you know how stuff works, you know, ergonomics, you know, some demand planning, then you get into it. But if I look at uh, all the people I've worked with, they did, you know, they were all engineering backgrounds, electrical, mechanical, software, and then this was something that they got into into a job. Okay. I think I think uh, from a structure point, I think uh, you know, uh, uh, APIC certification is definitely something that gives you that. That gives you that. It's a ready-made platform. It gives you an exposure, and once you have that, you know, you're recognized globally. You can say, okay, I, I know this because this is a globally recognized uh, certification. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what uh, can you describe some of the aha moments, you know, when you enter this industry and help customers or something which you uh, felt very proud and you said that this is what I've achieved or done for a customer or so or something? Sure, sure. So I think the first aha moment was what I told you when I actually looked at it the first time. <laughs> you know, that was like it sucked me in. It said, yes, I, I want this. Um, and I think. Uh, you know, I, I learned a lot uh, during my tenure in the U.S. You know, but I had never, I, I'd learned how to design, I had learned how to do throughput calculations, I had learned how to, you know, what fits where. That was pretty much it. Uh, but then, you know, when I came to India, uh, I'd come here for business development. You know, and uh, I'm no salesman, mind you, I'm no salesman. <laughs> so, so but, but I have to sell because that's what my job required me to do. And um, I think um, the first two years was really a challenge. I think the customers weren't ready and I too wasn't ready. I would all automatically always come with a nice PowerPoint and show them things and everything. And they would mostly would think, yeah, it's nice, Disney World, Disneyland. Please come spend half an hour, an hour, that's it. It never went beyond a certain point or it never be, went beyond a point where I gave them a price and I, they would never call me back again or they would never pick up my phone call. And then, you know, I think there was a point where it was almost like maybe this is not going to happen. Oh. Maybe this is not going to happen and maybe uh, I'm, I'm not doing the right thing, you know. But uh, I think uh, what changed was, you know, I started visiting more factories and more warehouse connected to factories. And uh, I would go and just sit for weeks to understand the customer's operation, you know, and um, um, in that I was able to find a lot of things that could be improved by using technology, by using automation and um, telling that to the business owner that, yeah, I've looked at your factory for a week and I think there are these four things that you can actually improve. and. Many times they would not know that they were an issue or they would know that it's an issue, but they wouldn't know what would solve it solution. because they're so busy doing, you know, taking care of the whole big picture. And then, you know, I would present, 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 convince, convince, convince to a point where they would say, I think it makes sense. So, you know, explaining them just on a PowerPoint, on a piece of paper, you know, on a CAD file to them, then trusting you with their operations trusting you to change their factory and giving you a purchase order for 20 crores. I think that, <laughs> that is the aha moment. And that, that, is, that I still enjoy very much. That is right. still what I enjoy very much to this day. Yeah. So um, I think we have very less time. So uh, let me ask two questions. You know, if you have to hire people, what kind of people you would hire? What you would look for in them? I, I think I think the most important thing I would look, and maybe it's a cliche, but I, it applies to me, is the attitude. Yeah. 
I think I think attitude is really important. Um, as this field is still very new, uh, uh, you know, in India, it's not that I can go quote somebody from a competition, or even if I do that, it's not going to be useful, right? So, uh, 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 so we've actually done a lot of uh, 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 programs in house where when somebody comes in at day zero, we assume he knows nothing, but the idea is by day ninety. He must know at least this. So we've, we've developed a good set of crash courses to do that. And uh, I think so when I'm looking at someone, I'm not looking how much he knows already. I think I'm looking at does he want to do does he really want to do this? Does he really want to go solve people's problem? Does he really want to travel? And does he have the attitude that I'm going to find something to help this customer? Because honestly, we are not a product company. I, I think if I just said, oh, this is an ASR, it's go buy it, nobody would buy it. Until I solve a problem that a customer may or may not know he or she has, I cannot do anything with Mesa. So I think uh, attitude, a problem solver, and somebody who's willing to just go out and try. Well, I think uh, the connection there is lost. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just there on the standstill mode. All right. So, uh, in the meanwhile, I think a wonderful, wonderful session, wonderful insights from uh, you, Mr. Asim. You know, there a lot of uh, while the discussion was going on, there was a whole lot of uh, parallel discussion that was going on in the uh, chat box also. You know, okay. so it was it was really wonderful to see how people are getting to this. So, uh, I'll take up the question and questions from the uh, guests now. Uh, mainly questions were around the cost. Okay, let me tell you that you did answer a lot of things uh, between that also, but still. So there were people, you know, uh, uh, I'll not take a specific question. There's a mix of two, three questions which have come up. Okay, so right. people said that India is a little slow in implementing uh, the automation because of the cost uh, factor and we have manpower at a cheaper price. So sorting and picking up is much easier and much cheaper than going for an automation. Where else uh, another one said that, you know, uh, it is good for when you say there are 800 orders, but what happens when it converts into 80,000 orders? How many manpower you're bringing? How much? And so, you know, so this is the debate that was going on, you know. So what is your take on that? And how would you say is the best strategy to optimize, you know, manpower cost and still you know, have automation and not auto automation. What would you, what is your thought on that? Sure, I, I, thank you. And I think, uh, and I think the answer is within those questions itself. But I will elaborate. So, uh, as I said, you know, I gave some reasons of why automation happens in different geographies. Right? India is unique to that because we've got, like somebody said, we've got a lot of manpower. We have people who are young. You know, we don't have any problem of uh, you know people not being able to do hard work and all of that. So that that's a fantastic thing to have. Yet on the same token, on the same token, the answer to one of the answer is when the volume increases beyond a certain threshold, right? When let's say if you're handling maybe let's say I don't know, hundred pallets per hour, right? Do you need to have conveyors and ASRs and stuff like that? Maybe not. Maybe not. But what if you are doing upward of 300 pallets per hour? You can just imagine, you know, a restricted space with people running around in their forklifts or hand pallet trucks with 300 pallets an hour. It's going to be impossible. You would need to have traffic lights and, you know, people in the warehouses, you know, traffic police in the warehouses giving directions. So I think um, the, the 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 throughput is definitely a big factor of, you know, whether you put in automation or not, because beyond what the humans can do safely and do efficiently. Two, I think it would also be the the uh, environment. So, for example, if it's a harsh environment, if it's a radioactive environment, if it's a cold environment, you know, you don't want people to go into those environments to expose themselves to, you know, such uh, extremities to go do stuff. So there, that there you would need. And also, I think uh, you know what's happening in India is now a lot of the Technology is coming in from foreign co companies, you know, and there there is an ROI, so the price point is such. So that price point in India becomes a little difficult. But you see a lot of other local Indian companies also getting into this business, and they're setting up new price points, and they're doing <laughs> stuff that people are able to find or justify, you know, investing in that. 
So eventually what will happen is I think in India we'll have a new set of price points that will be applicable for the Indian context to help justify the investment in automation. Great. I think that's a, that's a, that's a pretty great answer. And I think uh, uh, Tibendu, Mithali and Malcolm, I think you, this was the discussion and I think you have the correct answer for you. Uh, so the next uh, question is from Mr. Dibendu. He say, is he asks, uh, is there any thumb rule that uh, specific space or specific SQ number or specific transaction, uh, uh, you know, transaction level invites mechanization in general? Uh, I don't think there is a thumb rule. I think it's a combination of the external factors that I mentioned. The throughput, the material being handled, the ambient temperature, and where you are. So I don't think there's a general thumb rule. I think it uh, depends on a lot of these factors. So if you, for example, if you, like I said, one of our customers, he does not have that many, um, uh, you know, uh, he could still do things manually, but he had no space. He had to expand his factory. So for him, a lot of the things did not check off for him to put in an ASRS, but it was just a sheer lack of space and his growth that he had in the last decade, right? Uh, the other example could be, you know, uh, if you're expanding, uh, you're setting up a new factory, uh, you know, uh, in an owner-driven company, the owner still has to go every day to make sure the factory is running, you know, in tip-top shape. And that's because in an owner-driven company, it's difficult to get the professional level of management, let's say a bigger company would have, right? So his presence or his or her presence needs to be there every day. But if you're setting up a factory 200 kilometers away, you cannot go there every day. You cannot make sure that, you know, if you're a food company and the most important thing to you is first in, first out, it has to be guaranteed. Otherwise, you're going to end up having stock that is old or you're going to end up using stuff that is older and giving a bad product. So first in, first out is an absolute must for you. So there an ASRS makes sense, even though labor is cheap, even the throughputs are not so high, but you have an issue depending on the local availability of people there to trust on the first in first out. Maybe they don't understand that concept as much. So you put an ASRS, it happens automatically. Got it, got it. Great, great. So thank you so much for such a wonderful explanation. So uh, let me tell you all the answers that you're giving are getting responses that it's a wonderful explanation and thank you so much. Well, uh, so the, the next question is from uh, uh, Gopi Krishnan. Yeah, he asked that uh, how is the market outlook in India and key selection criteria for choosing warehouse automation options available and what is the minimum budget requirement? Okay, so I think the warehouse automation market in India is just going to go up, up and up. And I think if you're looking at a career choice, I would really say this is apart from IT, you know, this is one thing that you'll be guaranteed a job in the next uh, two decades or so. So I think I'm very excited about the next two decades. That's going to happen. Um, the second part of it, I'm sorry, what was the second part? So what is the minimum budget required? Uh, you know, the minimum has to be in crores. It, it's a couple of crores at least, to be honest. Anything you look at, it's a couple of crores. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it could be something as simple as, let's say, the first part of automation may be putting in a WMS. You know, the first part, forget the hardware for a second. The first thing that you'd say, you know what, I want to get off a paper-based or an Excel-based uh, inventory management system into a more uh, formal WMS, and you then you need servers, you need licenses, you need uh, desktops and all of that. So that itself is a few lakhs to a crore. So I think anything you talk about is at least a crore to begin with, and then it can go on from there. Got it. Got it. So... Uh, we'll take last two questions. Uh, uh, this is from again from Mr. Dibendu. So he says, which are segments mostly using ASRS? Is there any indication on cubic or square feet cost for ASRS? So I think as I was talking earlier, I think the biggest consumer of ASRS is the pharmaceutical industry in India. Right. They have been so since two decades now. Um, then um, obviously when stuff gets very heavy to handle, for example, the steel industry, a coil of steel is 25 tons, very difficult to move that. So you have an ASRS in steel industry. Uh, so with paper, big rolls of paper, very difficult to handle, but you have to handle. So you've got ASRS there. Um, uh, where throughputs are very, very high, the paint sector, 
because you know the paint industry is you know you don't, you cannot set up factories everywhere. You have to set up a mega factory, and there's only so many places where you'd be allowed because of you know what you're producing. So once you set up this mega factory, the volumes are huge, huge. So there you need an ASRS, um, and then um, I think uh, obviously in the food and beverage, and in that more so beverage because the beverage industry is still growing up in India, but uh, it's very seasonal. I think you have the summer peaks and everybody plans for that summer peak. So in that summer peak, normally what you do is you produce enough upfront and then you store it elsewhere. But like with anything, the minute you have more touches before it gets to the customer, the integrity and the safety of that comes in question. So therefore people would like to store it in their own premises versus storing it elsewhere. So beverage is industry is something where you see. Um, what else? Uh, um, and there's a whole bunch, but I would say these are the primary big ones. Pharmaceutical, paints, uh, uh, beverage, papers. Right, so, so the second part was, is there any indication on cubic or square feet cost for ASR? Uh, I, I think if you, uh, I, mean, I know, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to be on record to say this, but I think a lot of the customers, you know, when they're looking into this investment, they talk about price per pallet. You know, they talk about price per pallet if it's a palletized load. And this price per pallet uh, is different depending on the application. It's not just the storage itself, it's everything around it, what you've designed, what you have done to move it from point A to point B. So this is something that uh, in the market, depending on how complex the system is, could be anywhere from as low as I mean, I've seen something as low as, you know, 15, 18,000 rupees per pallet to all the way up to 100,000 per pallet. OK, got it. Uh, great. So this is the last question that we'll take uh, for this particular show. So this is by uh, Mr. Arun Khanna. So he says that with e-commerce poised in and with uh, Make in India coming in, so there's a big push for, you know, flexibility, handling, utilizing loads and everything. So this is specific to your company, actually. Um, you know, you, you may choose to not answer. You may choose to you take as you want. So he basically asked, so what are the plans of your company to equip uh, with this current uh, requirement in India and uh, be present as an omni-channel omni warehousing and be a global leader in the process? No, I would be more than happy to answer that question, I think. Thank you, Mr. Aaron, for that question. So. Um, Daifuku uh, is a global leader in internal logistics automation, and I think we are one of the very few top five multinational who has a direct subsidiary in India. I think uh, I can say that, uh, and we've been here, uh, Daifuku India has been here since 2005. Um, I think originally it was for uh, uh, the automotive uh, industry, so uh, Daifuku is big into the automotive industry. So. Every time you know you have a Toyota or a Maruti Suzuki or Nissan, you're driving one. A part of the manufacturing process, aiding the manufacturing process, Daifuku equipment. Um, um, so 2005, Daifuku has been there, and then 2014 is when inter logistics automation started uh, for Daifuku in India. So we've been a very early mover uh, in terms of uh, believing in the market, even though at that point the scope wasn't there, but we believed in the market and continued to do so. Also, uh, I think uh, it's public knowledge now that uh, last fiscal year in uh, April of 2019, Daifuku Japan acquired a company called Vega Conveyors and uh, Automation. It's a local company based out of Hyderabad who do conveyors mostly. So our plan was to have a local manufacturing in India simply because, you know, to get to the flexibility that the customer expects the timeline the customer expects, and hopefully the budget that the customer expects, we can achieve that by doing local manufacturing. So that is a, a, a work in progress. Obviously, the pandemic happened and uh, the speed isn't what we had planned for, but it's still on track. So we're very much committed to India. We're very much committed to the market, and we believe we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now. Hey, wonderful. Thank you. So I think uh, that's how that's where we come to an end. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Asim, to uh, take out time, join us, and for wonderful insights. This uh, this session undoubtedly has been one of the 
uh, funnier and the interesting sessions among all the five that we have had. So thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you Ravindra sir for hosting the event and as yeah. always uh, we keep learning from you always. So uh, for the audience thank you for taking your time on Saturday joining us uh, in the evening. I hope you have got a lot of learning although we have been seeing a lot of comments in the chat box. Uh, I'm sure that will make uh, Mr. Asim also happy that his insights were really helpful to everyone. Uh, please do uh, keep attending the shows. Uh, the next one we have is on 24th of October and the topic for that is again uh, uh, very much related to the logistics part. It is uh, uh, tracking in transportation. So I'm sure a lot of people are hearing a lot of things uh, related to tracking and uh, uh, how to track trucks and everything. So here's a chance to listen from the uh, industry leaders on 24th of October. Do join us at uh, 4 p.m. on the same link. If you're enjoying uh, this format of uh, talk show, please do uh, spread the word among your friends, colleagues. Please ask them to join as much as possible. It's free of cost. Uh, there is nothing uh, that you need to do. There's no registration and nothing required. Please feel free to join. Uh, if you have any feedback, we have put down our number and email address where you can uh, come back to us. If you have a topic suggestion or if you have uh, a speaker suggestion, please feel free to uh, connect with us. One last thing, uh, I have also put up uh, the links to join uh, our app. So you can download the app. We have a very interesting uh, competition on IPL running right now. If you win, you uh, if you win the competition, you get a uh, smartphone, AirPods, AirDope. So pretty interesting things. Download the app and uh, you can get all the details there. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for joining in. Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, sir. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having See you again, everyone on 24th October. Thank you. Thank you and have a great weekend. Yeah, bye bye. Be safe. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care.